Okay, I think we can get started. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy McCormick. I'm board president of the Pratt Memorial Library in Old Greenwich, Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us for, for tonight's program with Lee Woodruff and Laura Munson in conversation about Laura's new book, uh, Willis Grove. I wanna thank the um, uh, members of the Pratt Memorial Library Association whose generous contributions make programs like these possible. If you're not a member, please consider joining us. Details can be found on our website, paratmemoriallibrary.org. Um, in addition, I want to say that um, Laura's book and Lee's books are available for checkout at paratmemoriallibrary.org and for purchase at Diane's Books. Laura also mentioned that she has some beautiful bookmarks that she'd be happy to sign. If you're interested in getting a signed bookmark, we can discuss afterwards how to contact us um, to get that. Um, all set. This program is recorded and you will get a copy of the recording um, via email um, when, after you signed up. And Laura and Lee have agreed to add, uh, answer questions and you can put those questions in the uh, chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so now we're going to get started um, welcoming our guests. Um, it is my honor to introduce Lee Woodruff, who is an author, public speaker, and journalist. A former contributing reporter for CBS This Morning and Good Morning America, she's the best-selling author of three books, as well as numerous articles and essays. She now runs a communications and media training business, working with clients around the globe. Her best-selling book, Perfectly Imperfect, A Life, Life in Progress, was followed by her first novel, those We Love Most, which became a New York Times bestseller. And in 2013, Lee visited Prop for a discussion. Lee and her husband, Bob, are the founders of the Bob, Bob Woodruff Foundation, which has contributed more than $65 million nationwide. Our author, Laura Munson, is a New York Times um, and international bestselling author um, of the memoir, This Is Not the Story You Think It Is, A Season of Unlikely Happiness. And her new um, US a Today bestseller, the novel Willis Grove. Her books have been published in nine countries and featured in Vanity Fair, Elle, Red Book, Time, Newsweek, Washington Post, Publishers Weekly, and many other newspapers, magazines, and on, online venues across the globe. She's the founder of the acclaimed Haven Writing Retreats and has worked with hundreds of people in locales around the states and internationally. Her work has been published in the New York Times, Modern Love Col Column, the New York Times Magazine, O Magazine, The Week, Huffington Post, Red Book, Woman's Day, Good Housekeeping, and many others. She has appeared on Good Morning America, The Early Show, WGN, many NPR stations, Hay House Radio, as well as many other media, including London's The Morning, This Morning and Australia's Sunrise. She lives in Montana with her family. Welcome to Lee and Laura. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Parat Library and Diane's Books. And thank you, Lee. I'm so excited for our discussion tonight. And I'm so excited to see so many familiar names here tonight. Welcome. Hey, everyone. Hey, Laura. Hey, Lee. Montana girl. <laughs> we got frost on the pumpkin out here. I don't know about over there in uh, New York. Well, I just was overhearing at the Parat Library the chat about the farmer's market. Sounds like it was the last day, ladies, right? So it's that kind of, it's that time of year. Hi, girl. Hello. What well, you, we wrote, you wrote another book. Uh, yeah, I've written like 24 unpublished books, but uh, they're all on the other side of this wall in, a, in my office closet. But uh, yeah, I've got two published. They, they both became bestsellers, two different genres. You know all about that. We both love different genres. And now I'm working on a book about creative self-expression that will be yet another genre because That's why not? Awesome. Yeah. Well, why don't we start just for a second with that? Because um, Kathy read the the impress your impressive bio, but I think one of the most impressive things you are doing now is the Haven um, Writing Workshop and re Retreat. And I want you to just tell everybody a little bit about that because I have sent countless women there, I'm not looking for any praise or anything or any commission or any of that. <laughs> I'm just saying I have a lot of people at our stage in life who are feeling like they have a story to tell. And you and I both believe everybody has a story to tell. And you are the ultimate person at helping people do that. So can you just talk a little bit about that before we get into the book? 
Well, sure. Well, actually, it goes, it, it bleeds right into the book because uh, I was sitting on the edge of my bed one morning, as we often are with our very best ideas after we've been in that, you know, sleep trance all night, thinking, how can I capture what's what happens at Haven Writing Retreats? And I've worked now with over a thousand people from all over the globe. I have a foundation. Thank you to the Bob Woodruff Foundation for all that you do. I have the Haven Foundation, which um, can provide scholarships, partial scholarships to people in need who couldn't afford the retreat. So I'm really proud of that. The, the retreats become very diverse because of it. Um, but I've worked with people from all over the globe. Uh, I, I've got a thousand alums and it's ranked in the top three writing retreats in the country. And then Haven One, which is the retreat itself begat Haven 2, which is a, a proper workshop artist salon held in my house. Haven 3, I become people's full-time editors. And then um, I've got all sorts of writer in residencies and um, online workshops, online communities. It's just become this big thing. But I was sitting there one morning thinking, how can I capture the magic of what happens when people gather live in a novel because fiction is my favorite genre. And without revealing anything about the people who come on my retreats um, and really- oh, Go ahead and dish, give us some celeb names, come on. No, I've got the oh, same right. ethics as a therapist. I'm not one, <laughs> thank God, but I worked with a lot of them. But the uh, I just wanted to capture not a writing retreat, but what happens when people who probably would never meet each other in their normal lives come together for a five day respite from their lives all the way out here in the pristine, beautiful wilderness of Montana. Things happen for people. I just finished my last one for 2021 on Sunday. So it's so fresh in my mind what, what goes on for people. And we can talk about it. But that that's what birthed Willis Grove. So talk to us about the book. Give us the, that thumbnail sketch. And then just actually, before you do that, that sense of a retreat where everybody goes into their own bubble and you come out, there must be so many connections made there, which I know is part of the Willis Grove story, which we'll get to just in a sec, but what happens to the, the glue and the connective tissue that happens when, when people gather, write, and share their stories? What's the magic? Well, this, that, you just nailed it. It's the storytelling. Even though this is not a storytelling retreat, the Haven Writing Retreat, it's really about finding your voice, getting your finger on the pulse of what's behind what you have to say. I always say that writing isn't just writing, it's living in a way that helps us find what we have to say. And sometimes that means leaving home and not bumping into people in the grocery store with whom we raise children or coworkers or people who might judge us or scrutinize us. It's, there's something so refreshing about leaving all that for the express intention of figuring out what it is that we have to say and how to express it freely and safely, even and especially if it's dark material, inconvenient truths, dirty secrets, we've got really good rules at Haven that keep people really safe. And I think that's why they bond so quickly. So in Willis Grove, I wanted to capture the same thing, but without it being prescriptive. In fact, the first time I wrote it, it was so prescriptive, it was disgusting. Like I, I wanted to take a shower afterwards. <laughs> so. I wrote it all out and then, you know, said, thank you for your service, goodbye, and then started all over again and really let the characters tell the story. So the book is about four women all at major crossroads moments and relatable ones. I tried to think of ones that um, were indicative of, of those that people that I love and know well are, are going through. And I wanted to capture those crossroads moments because what happens, I think, when we're all facing that, so now what? And I do want to read the invitation to the book yeah. um, that the characters get, uh, invitation to the to the story that the characters get. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to really tap into the collective crossroads so now what that we all face because so many of us hide you know what I mean like so many of us just cower out of fear of judgment out of fear of running into people buying broccoli how are you I'm fine I'm fine when really we're bleeding inside you know well, I do know. And I think after COVID, certainly that changed for so many people. And as someone said to me the other day, I, I feel like I have no skin and, mm -hmm. and just the feeling of, you know, being raw and out in public again, and trying to understand what all that means and a lot of anxiety. So what, what was that like? I assume that the, the retreat you just had was in person. So talk about what it's like, what's it like to do that after COVID? What's it like to be in a book tour, in a book tour right now? And be doing this on Zoom. You actually, Willis Grove, you were in the process and you'd gotten a couple of markets under your belt, I remember, and then 
the pandemic shut down your book tour and so many other friends, so but many. everybody pivoted. Yeah. Just thoughts on that and advice for all of us crawling out of COVID right now. <laughs> well, my pub date for the hardback was March 2nd, 2020. <laughs> so I was all over New York. I was all over the greater New York area, Boston, Chicago, where, where I'm originally from Minneapolis, March 13th hit. And I was just lying in the hotel room, staring at the ceiling, thinking, that's it. I'm not going to San Francisco. I'm not going to Portland. I, mean, I was scheduled to be on the road for two months. And um, so I canceled 38 events and, you know, get, got my adult children home and bought beans and rice and toilet paper like everybody else and took it online. And it's been incredible to see how libraries and bookstores have pivoted as well. Some of the things that I did, so I did a bunch of online stuff um, when the hardback came out and then the paperback came out after that. So um, that's what I'm promoting right now. But one of the things that um, I've really seen um, in terms of, you know, I lead retreats for a living outside of writing, that's what I do. And so I took all my stuff online, not the retreat, because there's no way you can capture the live experience of a retreat. But so I, I started doing virtual workshops, like two hour workshops or an all day workshop. I'm not doing these right now. Um, I started this thing because I thought, I feel like we're at in wartime, you know? So what can I do to help? You know, I, I believe, I have said this a million times and I'm quoting myself, I think writing should be up there with diet and exercise in the realm of preventative wellness. So I thought, how can I help people get through this time using writing um, and and I actually used something that's in, in the book, uh, the question of, so now what? Because we're all facing that, you know, with COVID. So um, I did this thing for a year and a half, every single Friday for free for an hour. I guided people through um, what I call, so now what journaling to help people shed the past, embrace the present and, and you know, dream their futures alive. And I did an eight week online course. I'd never done any of this stuff, Lee. This was all new. In fact, I don't even like online stuff, but we all have learned how to be friends with it. But what I'm doing now is I've, I've started this online community, which is ongoing, that's, um, that's called Haven Nest. And a lot of people who are in Haven Nest are here now. Um, Lee was one of our experts for the eight week course. Thank you, Lee. And um, I, I love online stuff now because I think that people can do it from the comfort of their own home now. That said, having just led three basically back-to-back -back live retreats in Montana with groups of eight people, there's nothing like it. People miss looking into each other's eyes. I mean, you know, with good boundaries, some people wore masks. Uh, Montana does not have a mask mandate right now. So it was at your discretion, but people were just so quickly excited to embrace each other, touch each other, look at their facial expressions and not just from like here down, I mean, here up, <laughs> but like the whole self. And I also found that like people bonded much quicker than they normally do. They were so grateful for every little thing, just the, the way the sun was coming through the, the window in our classroom. I, I just found people, I've, I, again, I've done this since 2013 with over a thousand alums, small groups. I've never seen such gratitude. That was the big thing I noticed. When you first wrote the book and we were talking, you wanted to start a movement with Willis Grove. So talk about that and what that means and what that's turned into and why. That's a lot of questions. There's a lot of W's. So I'll just shut up and you can answer them all. Well, just so happens that I have a letter to the reader in the back of the book, which essentially gives you the answer. You ready, everybody? I'm ready. I'm going to go on mute in case I burp by accident, which I wouldn't want to do. That's okay. So My, doorbell just, My doorbell just rang the UPS guy. <laughs> so, you know, we're human. There we go. All right. So there's a line in the book, I do want to start a movement. And I think that we need it even more than before. Like never when I wrote this book did I realize how timely it would be. We're all, oh, there's the doorbell again. We're all asking this question right now. So now, no, I'm not going to go <laughs> answer the door. <laughs> We're all asking this question right now. So now what? So there's a line in the book that one of the characters says, and then I'll read this letter to the reader. And this really uh, encapsulates what I want for this movement. And I think we can do it now, now that we're gathering together, who knows what's going to happen, but we are gathering. People are getting on airplanes. People are, and boy, airplanes are really clean right now. <laughs> That's been my experience. Anyway, 
you know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community, and yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. I'll read that one more time. You know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community, and yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. That's what we're all craving, community. So here's the, here's the letter to the reader. Dear reader, I have learned something that might just be the most important lesson of my life, and I would like to share it with you. There is a language that we crave, a language of the heart that grows from our worry and our wonder and our stories rooted in our experience of this beautiful and heartbreaking thing called life. Too many of us have trained ourselves out of speaking that language. We were all fluent in it when, when, when we were children, but somewhere along the way we were taught or conditioned to forget it, to not be honest when we are asked, how are you? And to not really listen to the answer when we ask others the same question. So many of us have lost our authentic voices and reduced our conversations to grocery store talk and text with an emoji at the end. The truth is we long to be seen and heard and accepted, especially when we are in pain. Yet out of fear of judgment or rejection, we too often draw in and become islands rather than bridging to our family and friends. I know this because at times I've made that choice. And the fallout from that led me to devote a major piece of my life to bringing people together in safe, intimate circles of self-expression, which led me to write this book I wrote Willis Grove to capture the power of people stepping out of the isolation and self-doubt that so many of us feel in times of transition and instead gathering together. These women show us that we don't have to endure hardship alone, nor should we. We have choices. If for whatever reason, connecting with our usual community is too fraught, we can instead create temporary circles, friend to friend to friend to friend, carving out small interludes from our daily lives in order to focus on what comes next, to have those conversations we need to be having but aren't, to move boldly outside of gossip and small talk, pretending and into the connection we so deeply need. I hope that in reading this book and in the spirit of Willa, Bliss, Harriet, and Jane, you will be inspired to reach out to your own dear friends, whether close by or far away, and that you will invite them to come together for short respites to support one another in the powerful way that people can when they give themselves permission to say yes to the profound invitations of their lives. My mission is this, we will start a movement of week long interludes from the stresses and pain of our crossroads moments and in radical and real communication, we will provide ourselves and our kindreds with a map for our next steps. Our voices deserve to be honored and heard. No one has your voice, no one. However we speak, now is the time for truth. And yes, we don't have to do it alone. Yours, Laura. That is, the movement I want to start. And I'm going to read you the invitation because that will explain a lot. Does that sound good, Lee? Okay. So, so the idea is that the central character, Willa, is at a major crossroads moment. Her husband has just died unexpectedly quite young and of a heart condition that um, 
she didn't know that he had. And she has been absolutely hibernating, hiding. Um, their whole thing together was the Emersonian dream of self-reliance. And they moved out to Montana, took over his family's homestead and created this town of 34 people, raised kids, and they were the cornerstone of it. So without him, she really looks at just how self-reliant am I? And as a result, she feels a whole lot of shame. And I think that's what happens. Um, that's what happens when we are in these crossroads moments. There are often things that we chose, like being a parent or choosing a spouse or partner or choosing a job and we no longer want it or it fell apart, especially with COVID. And so we feel shame because we made those choices, right? We, we invited those things in our lives. We don't invite illness. We don't invite having, having a, an elderly parent who's sick. Um, we don't invite death but we invite those things into our lives. We choose those things. So there's a lot of shame I find when people are in crossroads moments. And I work with a lot of people who come to Haven who are, are, are wanting to write a book because of just that reason. So here's the way this book begins and the invitation, and then we can get back into conversation with the fabulous Lee Woodruff. Okay, this is how it begins. On a typical day in their typical lives, three women went to their mailboxes and found amid junk mail and bills and shiny flyers for unshiny things, an invitation sealed with a bold W pressed into sage green wax. They had been waiting for this invitation. They longed for it as much as they feared it because to break the seal was to release a behemoth of a question, a question so impossible that they had almost stopped asking it. Each hesitated, looked around, and in respective order thought, sweet Jesus, what the hell? Here goes nothing, and slid her finger under the seal, revealing a thick handmade note card pressed with silvery leaves. Words winked up at them, words that might, if given the chance, change everything. They swallowed and pulled out the card. Inside, nestled with a wild bird feather, were the following words. And I hope you all who are, who are here tonight or watching this archived will ask yourself the same thing that this invitation asks of these women. You are invited to the rest of your life. You know you can't go on like this, not for one more day. You need an interlude. Imagine this, you are in a farmhouse in Montana, wrapped in a soft blanket, sitting by a warm wood stove. There's a cup of tea in your hand, just the way you like it. There are women surrounding you who need this just as badly as you do. We all have the same question. The question is, so now what? Come to Montana and find out, love Willa. You don't have to do this alone. Each woman held the invitation to her heart, drew in a deep breath before letting out an exhausted sigh that echoed from Connecticut, <laughs> from Connecticut to Wisconsin, to California and back to Montana and went inside to call a dear friend. So I'll just say, and then we'll get back to your questions. So what happens is that Willa is in hiding. She finally reaches out to her dear friend from childhood, who's also at a major crossroads moment. And that character, whose name is Bliss, says, why don't we have a week long retreat together? And why don't we host it at your house? Because Willa's thinking that she's probably going to have to sell the whole homestead, the whole town, and um, let go of their whole dream. And then they decide to throw this week long retreat. So then Bliss asks a friend who's also at a crossroads moment, that's Harriet. And then Harriet asks a friend and that's Jane who's also at a crossroads moment. So they all converge in Montana, convene in Montana. And what I love about this recipe, and this is the movement I wanna start, that, that they don't, they, everybody has at least one friend and I want to do this. And I want to do this with you, Lee, seriously. And like, I choose you, you choose a friend, that friend chooses a friend and we all go someplace together and we tell our stories and the way they do it is what was supposed to happen, what actually happened. And then they help each other figure out their next chapter. 
I'm unmuting now. So would that be the movement? You're encouraging other women or people, people. right? Is this, is this people. limited? This isn't limited. No, no, it's no. It's a no. very female thing, but I sense that it's also something probably that men should have permission to do. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and my retreats are open to men. They rarely come, um, but my retreats are, they're not ist anything. They're not genderist or ageist, et cetera. Um, but but you're right. Women are really drawn to this sort of thing. So without revealing what happens, I imagine there's a healing, which is why this would be a good movement because probably good things happen. So in the construct of a story, so for everybody out there, because I think people are fascinated, fascinated not just with how you came up with the idea, which you've already kind of explained, but your writing process. And for me, I, when people ask, you know, to, about writing a book or a novel in particular, because that's a story you're making up. Um, I always say the beginning and the end are easy. The yeah. hard part is the middle. How do you sustain someone in the middle? So in that middle part, talk to us about, did you write this fully formed? Did you know what was going to happen to all of them? Or did this beginning of the story take you where the story wanted you to go? <laughs> Only a writer would ask that question <laughs> or an editor. We call that the saggy middle, right? It's the sag. Yeah, because that's where a whole book can fall apart, by the way. Totally, totally. Well, so I told you at the beginning that I wrote this thing. I wanted to capture what happens on a retreat. So it was really prescriptive. Like they all showed up like, yeah, I'm ready to go on a retreat in Montana. And that just didn't work. Like you need conflict. And at Haven, we talk a lot about going into the heart of conflict because how are you going to find resolve if you're not willing to go? Go into the conflict. So, um, so the first time I wrote it was just, it was because I had this idea and I wanted people to read it and say, I'm going to throw this kind of retreat with friends as I've just described. Then again, I had to take a shower and start all over again. And I decided to give it to the characters. And once you give it to the characters, especially for a novel, and it, I think you're the one who said to me that writers mine our lives. I, I quote you all, you said that to me and I've thought about it and I say it all the time. Writers mine our lives, no matter what the genre, long form or short form. And, and I think that actually fiction is distilled reality. I think it's like realer than real. So once I gave it to the characters, they told the story and they kept that narrative drive moving. You can't have narrative movement. And for those out there, uh, of you out there who are writers, and I know there are a bunch of you that are, you know that I'm all about using the conflict to move the narrative. Um, it has to be scene driven, not observer driven, but scene driven. So I always run like five questions on all my characters. And for those of you who work with me, you already know them. It's um, and this is a good question for any of us to ask ourselves in our journals or just in our lives. What do we want? What's in the way of getting what we want? Are we in the way of getting what we want? Which is usually the thing, the self versus self conflict is to me in every single conflict. So it's what do we want? What's in the way of getting what we want? Are we in the way of getting what we want? What do we fear? What is our central conflict and what would it take to, to get to the resolve? And sometimes we don't know that. So, so I actually have never known the ending of any book I've ever written. I, I know the beginning. I know the, the, the question that I want the book to answer or the essay or the short story, but I don't know the ending. For me, and some people are plot-driven writers, I'm a character-driven writer. So I... I have to give it to the right, the characters and they then beget the plot. That's how I get rid of the saggy middle. So again, for writers out there, what, and this is being recorded and this is in this book I'm writing, what do they want? What's in the way of getting what they want? Are they in the way of getting what they want? That's always the case. What do they fear? What's their central conflict? And what would it take for them to find resolve for that conflict? That's how you get the movement. So, what you just said, how often are you asking those questions of the characters? You write a few chapters and then you go run through that matrix again, or that's an overarching thing you start with and then the characters just run away with what happens. The second one. But then when I get, you know, oh, I don't want to say stuck. I don't believe in writer's block, um, but most oh, of really? it. Really? Could you come over to my house and help me with that then? 
yeah, we can sit down, have tea and answer these questions about our characters, whether they're real or imagined. Um, I don't, I don't, and also, you know, cause most of what I hear on the first night at, at Haven is I'm stuck. And I think we need to get out of this story we're telling ourselves. It's not that we're stuck. It's that we just simply just aren't looking at it in a way that serves the reason why we, we need to write this thing in the first place. So I think we run those questions on ourselves as the creator of whatever we're creating. Cause I know not everybody out there is a writer. Um, the most powerful question I know is what can I create? If you run those questions on anything you wanna create uh, or if you're writing a book, your characters, again, whether real or imagined, if you're in the middle of, of what you're creating and you get, and you get a little bit uh, resistant, to me, the resistance is always the exact place where we need to go. You can run those questions on, on the resistance. I ran it, uh, those questions on Montana in the book because Montana is a character in the book. And I have to uh, tell you all, that this is so exciting. Last week, I signed a, um, a contract uh, for uh, Willis Grove to be optioned for a film. So there are no promises and it's a long process, but you know, I was a film major in college and everything I write is so cinematic in my mind. Like I've never been, in, I, 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 here's Montana. I'm up here near Idaho and Canada, near Glacier National Park in the Flathead Valley. Willis Grove is set in the middle, like dead center of Montana. I haven't spent a lot of time there. So I had to do a lot of fact checking and, um, and, you know, it's not a love letter to Montana, but, but Montana is definitely a character in the book. And the whole time that I was writing it and conceiving it, I could see everything in my mind's eye and I've never seen it before in my life. So when they said that they, these producers that are interested in it, it, it just, they, they, they said they could see it in their mind's eye. I thought, wow, that's going to be a lot to give up, but boy, would I love to see it be a movie. And I want to, I want to cast it too. <laughs> Maybe you could be in it. Cause my next question, remind me to get back to Montana. Are you Willa? Heck no. I, I, I always say, this is so funny right now. There are like 15 deer just like in, in my yard. Um, I'm still worried about the UPS man, by the way, that was really stressful for me. He was knocking at one point and you didn't even flinch. I would have had to cave because it was probably wine that needed your signature and you needed the wine, but good for you, girlfriend, because you just made the course. So that is you're not going to get your wine for another week now, by the way, your neighbor now has your wine and he's not going to tell you. No, the best wine distributor in the world, if you ask me, is Kermit Lynch. And that, yeah, that was probably my Kermit Lynch yeah, delivery. Good luck getting that back. <laughs> in rural Montana, Lee, only us, right? So, okay, what were we doing professionally just now? Oh, I am not Willa. But I like to say that each of these characters is somebody, so I am not any of these characters, nor are they anyone that I know. And yet I feel that they're all of us. So there, I would love to be Willa when I grow up. I'm definitely not, uh, you know, Willa is like really good at like chopping wood and chainsaw work. Uh, and, um, you know, she's- yeah, but You're a real outdoors woman in Montana. You've got, you're a very capable woman and you know how to get stuff done. So is every character a composite of you in some way? Are you in every character in some facet of yourself? I'll say it this way like you say, writers mind their lives. Each of these characters has a conflict, since I brought that up, that is something that I understand or can relate with. So for instance, Willa's conflict is self-reliance versus interdependence, i.e. community. Self-reliance versus interdependence. Um, uh, Bliss's uh, uh, conflict is something that I thought I would get a lot of heat for, but man, people have written me really beautiful emails about the bliss character her conflict is religion versus faith religion versus faith and then harriet's conflict and this one out of all of them this is the one that i've had the most um and at haven i tell a story about this ambition addiction ambition addiction splaying yourself supplicant on the altar of for me being published to wide acclaim just absolutely had me in the most horrible relationship with my self-worth for years and years. And it's when I let that go and I let go of the societally contracted myth of success 
it helped me to understand that that success is a failure by society's constructs as well as failure. And the, I mean, yes, and the only thing we can control is doing the work. That's just such a breath of fresh air. Um, so Harriet is in the thick of that. And and then Jane's Jane's conflict is really that money doesn't bring you happiness. She signed up for a demographic and an income and a persona uh, that's not serving her. And I thought that those were four really relatable uh, conflicts. So no, they're not me, but they're they're things that I I think that if you're wanting to write anything, it's it, you begin with a theme, you know, something that like that like charged or triggered for you, but often it's the theme that stops us. So instead of thinking theme based writing or self expression, verbal. Um, even in your mind, begin with a central question. So like for me, empty nest has been a big thing. Um, well, then with COVID, suddenly I had a very full nest and I was like running a boarding house for 20 year olds for a year and a half. But empty nest was huge for me. But that's just this big, like fraught theme. But if I can break down a question underneath the theme and say, who am I without my daily motherhood? You see how that opens everything up. So I think in any form of self-expression, if we can take the things that are most charged, flip them into a question, well, then that question begets an answer much more accessible. Why did you not pick your corner of Montana? Say it again. Oh, to, to, oh, to, to depict in the book. Um, because, <laughs> good question, Lee. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, okay, so Willa Montana has 34 people in it and they're all shunning her because they know she's putting up the town for auction. She doesn't want to expose the reason why, because likely the reason why there's no money is because her husband was um, dipping into their nest egg to help all these people, whether it's med for medical reasons or patching a roof, et cetera, fixing um, overflown, you know, overflown septic tank, et cetera, kind of rural living problems. And so she's allowing herself to be misunderstood, which is something I think is so important for everybody. Like sometimes we just have to allow ourselves to be misunderstood. And so I was really putting this little town under the microscope. I live in a small town. I live in Whitefish, Montana. It's growing. My goodness, so many people moved here um, because during COVID and like the tourists come and don't leave. Um, we suddenly have traffic issues and parking issues. And we're really, we fought an RV park. Our neighborhood did um, just this weekend. My daughter actually fought it. Uh, I was leading a retreat and we won 59 RV uh, units right across the street in rural Montana, which is zoned ag 40. I mean, things are really changing here. And I'm really, really um, sensitive to protecting where I live and not exposing it. So I sort of think like, if I'm going to write about Montana, I'm going to write about someplace other than right where I live, because our little mountain community cannot sustain the, the level of tourism and exposure that's happening right now and has been happening. I've lived here for 30 years. So uh, um, I didn't want to expose whitefish. Um, in my first book, my memoir, this one, it all takes place in whitefish. And I think perhaps that's part of it, Lee, that it was, there was so You're much- You're responsible for the trailer park is exactly what's happening here, girl. With the first book, you blew up the town because everybody wanted to, that was a bestseller. Yeah, that, now I'm pointing to figure you. And it was published in nine countries and it was an international bestseller, but no, I didn't know, now, no, I did not. <laughs> the, the, well, let's just say central Montana must not be happy because Yellowstone's blowing up now. So I would change your name and move to a new town if I were you. Yeah. Yellowstone is down here. Just saying, girl, I'm up here. Where in Montana is safe right now. Okay. It's all blowing up or anywhere. What's your next question, Lee? <laughs> I know. Okay. All right. What is the power of storytelling? Because that's really what you help people do. And I'm see, I'm looking in the chat right now and, and we're going to get close to questions guys. So if you have actual questions, throw them, throw them in there. But I'm seeing so many people who are as much of a Laura fan as I am. I'm not sure that's possible, but I'll give it to, to some of you guys out there. And I recognize some names and it's nice to see um, folks and friends on this Zoom call. But there's a lot of love going on in the chat box right now for you. So your ability to just in, to inspire 
motivate and pull a story out of someone is really a gift, but there's a power there. And I have friends who've come back from your retreats and basically said it was life-changing. My last friend, Cheryl, that went said it was life-changing. Now that's a pretty big thing to be able to do for people. So talk about that a little bit. Oh, well, I always say that if you're looking for a retreat, it, it, be careful if it's about the facilitator and really run for the hills if there are 10 easy steps to anything, especially writing uh, self-expression. It's got to be about the program. And so I say the program holds you. I created the program based on what I would want as a writer, as a writer, as a, an aspiring writer. Um, I hold the program and then the people at the ranch hold me. And that's critical to it being safe. So to that end, if you're in a situation where you want to tell your story, don't just tell anybody. So like, how are you buying broccoli again? I'm not doing so well. I'm having a problem. I've got diverticulitis. I got a child that's in crisis. Like it's like, maybe don't give everything away in the, you know, green grocery section of your grocery store. I think it's really important to find people who are safe. Um, in telling your story that said you got to tell your story so you got to find a place to do it and i think that um part of what works i'm just speaking as a retreat facilitator is to have rules and in willis grove i mean they they create rules so they're not nobody's facilitating this but they they're the ones that come together and and say we need some rules here if we're really going to help each other figure out our next chapters you know, because there's like, Jane's like, everything's fine. Okay, let's go do yoga, you know, or let's go take a walk or, you know, it's 11 o'clock. And by now I've given blood and served at three board meetings, you know, whereas um, Harriet is a huge self expressor She wants to tell stories. So, you know, that everybody here knows that it's like, either you're somebody who's a real extrovert in the way you tell stories and share, or maybe you're somebody who's more of a listener, who's always like, anyway, enough about me. How about you? So I think it's important to create a structure in which it's safe to tell the story that you need to tell. And, um, you know, you can't always like time it and have it be completely controlled, but I think just be smart about who you share your stories with. And again, in, in this book, they decided to make space for each other to say what they thought would happen, what really happened and to, re and to spend and to like, the way that each of these characters really, this is an overused phrase that I don't like using, but I can't think of a better one. They hold the space for each other to tell their stories. And I, I oh, that we could do that with one another simply as friends. Um, so just become aware of the people who are safe to tell your stories and the people who kind of don't really want to hear them. Don't go knocking on those doors, go to somebody that really will listen and find somebody who's an equal partner in the listening and the telling. And that's hard to find. And it's not always like a best friend I've found. So. I agree. Yeah. Sometimes it's not the best friend because they know you too well. That's right. And they take you personally. I just cringed when you said hold the space because I just actually came back from a women's retreat, which was not, we're not going to go into it. Um, but it was, it was, about the facilitator. And if I heard the term hold the space one more time, I was going to throw up and black out in that order. So yeah, we need to find a new term for that, but I, I feel you and hear you. Okay. Here's a question. And then we're going to go two questions okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, that I've always wanted to ask you, because one of the things that I'm just fascinated about with your writing retreat is you like made yourself into a teacher. Now I know how to write, and I just sort of do it, but I don't have any of the rules and I couldn't teach anybody else how to do it. I could edit somebody else's stuff, but you actually have a process you follow, terminology, all of this stuff. Did you always have that in your head or did you have to like go to the ground and really teach yourself how to be a teacher even though you did know all this stuff? Uh, you know, it's reinvention. Um, and you know all about reinvention. Um, we all do, all of us. Uh, we've lived long enough. Uh, even children know about reinvention. Our life is a process of reinvention. So I was quite honestly in post-divorce reinvention 
thinking, what can I monetize? Like, how am I, I like, you know, just because you're best selling author doesn't mean you're rolling in the dough. What can I do? And my dear friend, Jennifer Shelter, and you should all know Jennifer Shelter's work. She and I were roommates in Italy in, uh, in our junior year in college, lucky enough to be over there in Florence for a year with this wonderful family. And um, she invited me. She knew I was going through a really hard time. And she said, I think you'd be really, really good at teaching. And I lead this yoga retreat and I would like a, a writing component. It's in Tulum, Mexico. Come on down. I was like, I'm not a teacher. Uh. And she said, just you're doing it. <laughs> and so I went down there and after about 10 seconds of, of leading a class, I realized I know how to do this. Like, don't ask me to balance your checkbook or do anything with numbers. I was once on a stage in front of 2000 people, Lee, and I said four times three equals 15. Mm -hmm. That was great. That was a great moment, shining moment in my life. It maybe it does. I don't even know, but I it was the wrong addition or multiplication. Um, but I really have a strong sense of how to teach. I also have a strong sense of how to edit. And I also have yeah. a strong sense of how to structure people's work. I just have it. I just, we have things that yeah. we don't have. And the other person who told me, um, I shared the stage um, with the author, Danny Shapiro at the Mi Miami Book Festival. Um, when both of our books were coming out at the same time and they paired us and Danny afterwards, because she has uh, something that she does that's like a retreat, it's totally different than Haven um, uh, in Italy. And she said, you'd be really good at this because you're such an extrovert. She's more of an introvert. And um, so I just have the personality. I don't know. It's just, it's, yeah. it's really fun to have, to find just to, again, ask yourself these powerful questions and see what answers you can find. And my question at that time was, who am I and how do I know how to show up? And, and then frankly, how can I monetize it? But, you know, even if I didn't make any money off of doing any of this stuff, I would still do it. Probably not to the extent that I do, because I would want more writing time. Yeah. I friggin' love this. Just like you with your media training. Don't you love what you do? I mean, it's, I do. So yeah. I really long. enjoy it. Yeah. It is, but I do wish I had more writing time, but I'm riding the wave right now and still have two kids in college. So we all know what that costs. So mama's got to work. Mama's got to work. That's mama's got to work. You guys were at 10 minutes before we finish. And who has questions for Laura? Are you seeing the praise, Laura? Are you able to see the chat? Like people are just loving you and, and they're all chatting up Haven and people have been there. They're inspired. And if you're on this call and you haven't considered Haven or thought about a writing <laughs> retreat, you, you know, but I, no, I do think there's a lot, a lot of people say, oh, but I'm not a writer. I'm not a good writer. And honestly, most of the people that I have recommended to your retreat aren't writers at all, but everybody does have a story. So talk about the person that's on this uh, author talk tonight that's thinking, I do have a story, but I can't write my way out of the paper bag. What do you say to that person? everybody has a story just like you said beforehand and it's it's ultimately not about the words at all it's what's behind them and what's in between them and what's left in their wake I mean it's really about putting your finger on the pulse of what you have to say for you bridging to yourself because look you can turn a phrase or twist a plot or have a fabulous command of the English language until the cows come home but if you don't have that bridge to yourself it will never bridge to the audience, to the reader, and especially if you have a fabulous command of the English language and can turn a phrase and twist to plot, the reader won't understand why they're not connecting. And so the work really has to do with bridging to yourself in any realm of self-expression. And if, if it just so happens that you wanna then take that bridge to yourself, that experience of, of committing to that and put that into a book or a short story or a personal essay or whatever it is, that's, gravy. <laughs> it's really about self-awareness. And that's what I'm here to teach. Now, what I do has nothing to do with, it's not a self-help thing that I do. Um, it's not a mindfulness retreat, but writing, I mean, I say, I'm quoting myself and I've said this many times, but I can't say it enough. And it's a good reminder to myself, writing is my practice my prayer, my meditation, my way of life, and sometimes my way to life, which is what it was when I wrote that book. Uh, I also had a companion journal and I, anybody out there who's writing a memoir, please have a companion journal because some stuff goes in the journal and then other stuff goes into the crafted piece of work. Um, so that's, I think that's my answer to that question. 
Okay, well, while we're waiting for a couple more questions, I have one that I often get asked um, oh. because my first book was a memoir as well. Um, and so Number uh, one New York Times bestseller for like 5,000 weeks, nonfiction. Well, listen, in an instant, everybody buy it in an instant. Lee and Bob Woodruff. Thank you for the plug. And I'll send you a check shortly. On I, well, affiliate um, link. But people say, I feel like I know you. And my answer is, well, that's wonderful. And then I think to myself, but you know the parts of me that I want to show you. You don't know the parts that would hurt someone, as you said before, or aren't my story to tell. And I remember there was a, um, I don't know, maybe maybe between the first and second book, I, and this feels so old fashioned, but one of the magazines, remember those women's magazines asked me to come in and do a talk to the emerging concept of mommy bloggers back when people actually read and had blogs. And they were all, you know, posting stories about their children's explosive diarrhea and the diaper that, you know, blew off here and the Audi belly button. And I said to them, you need to think about the fact that this is not, that this child's going to grow up and go, what the heck, mom? Like, why were you, what? now kids at school call me explosive diarrhea. <laughs> and this isn't your story to tell. And how can you tell the story from your perspective, looking at your child? And that was, that was a moment for me when I, when I, thought about writing my book. So I love your concept of the separate stuff because, or the first just giant manual that you write that has all the stuff in it. And then you need to comb through it and think the book is around and in people's minds for a hot minute. My mother-in-law is going to be around for a few more decades. And what is more important? And I would say, choose your relationship every single time. Oh yeah. I got a million things to say about it. And in the interest of time, I'll say that a memoir you need to think of a memoir as a novel starring you as the main character, scene by scene by scene, like a movie. And not all of what we experience is, is, is ours to share with others. So it's about us. We are the main character. My whole team turned down the Oprah Winfrey show, Love Oprah, twice because we they wanted to expose my family. And that's not... This, that is the story you think it is. And I, you, so you have to really know your own personal rules and walk in that integrity. And that's what you'll attract. And then you meet Lee Woodruff. You know how we met? You were interviewing me last minute for Red Book Magazine. We mm -hmm. got on the phone. I had my like fake business voice on because I didn't know what I was doing. And there was no so, Zoom. There was just a phone back then. Yeah. Hello, this is Laura. And you're like, girlfriend. <laughs> it was just, that was it. Cut the voice. Like, you be yourself and yet you don't give everything away. It doesn't belong to everybody. Your story doesn't belong to everybody. But the number one thing that memoir writers hear, authors of memoirs, and you just said it, is thank you for helping me know that I'm not alone. It's a yeah. gift that you give by exposing yourself. And we have to have the courage to write past the fear of exposure, but you don't have to give it all. Okay. No. What are the questions? We've yeah, got let's go. Come on, people. You must have a question. You've got, oh God, I'm sorry. I did not um, scroll it, down. So uh, if you put okay. it down, we don't have a Q&A because this is a, uh, not a webinar because we're all like Zoom fluent now, um, or some of us are. I kind of am. Oh, go down to wow. the chat. Wait, but I just have to say, Liz Beckman gave me a different uh, phrase for holding the space. Be present. Oh, Liz, thank you. I love thank you. you, Liz. Thank oh, you. Oh my God, Liz. You're for stopping me from throwing up my sushi dinner. So I love you for that. <laughs> okay, so life-changing. I was just sitting here and I re didn't realize there were things. Okay, so here we go. Did the vastness of Big Sky Montana play in having the novel take place there? Big Sky to find space to grow. Of course. Montana has, th thank you for whoever asked that question. Um, Sandy, I'm sorry. I should have said Sandy's name. Sandy Alvin Seagartel. And I'm sorry if I just botched that. Hi, Sandy. Um, of course, like Montana has been my best my best teacher. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, went to a New England prep school and a little With private- With a Lance nightgown. Shh. Greenwich knows Lance nightgowns. No, you're in good company here. <laughs> I New know England. Greenwich, Darian, okay. Kane, and all. But wait, if, you're like from, if you're from the Midwest and you go to New England prep school, you're like Dorothy, like click your, you know, red shoes together. Nobody. Um, so anyway, what am I talking? Let's have a therapy session about what it's like being from the Midwest and going to New people. England. I married one of them. So don't you dare the get back to Montana. 
we're from the side. So I, um, but we used to grow, like a lot of Illinois people do, or Chicago people, we go up to Northern Wisconsin in the summer. That's me pointing to Wisconsin. And um, I, I feel like that's where I always came alive on lakes. I am a lake baby. I know you love lakes. Um, and this part of Montana is full of lakes, inspiring mountains. And it's just so cozy and full of conifers it's not that big wide open kind of east side you know like john wayne um sagebrush tumble wood weed kind of place it's it's much more pacific northwest and um i just this place holds my heart and it serves up a whopping dose of writing inspiration every single day so i mean i i don't like to consider myself a western writer because i still consider myself a chicagoan uh and yet how can I, I mean, on my knees every day with humiliation, admiration, uh, abundance, just living here. Grizzly bears, we're on the food chain here, you know? You so, better yes. not be food there. Let's keep yourself out of that chain, okay? <laughs> okay, but I can't control it. And that's what I love about it. I love that I walk outside to look at the beautiful night sky and anything could happen. It's a beautiful place. Anything might have happened to that UPS guy. Maybe the grizzly got him because he did stop knocking at some point, but I'm still worried about your wine. You're going to have to tell me about that. Yeah, no, I am concerned. <laughs> All right, three minutes or two now, because we are good timekeepers here. The Greenwich Mean Time, we call it, which is the standard for the world. So anybody have any last thoughts? I think, you know what I love about Laura? Many things. Um, yeah, amazing session. Thank you, Sandy. Um, you had a connection to the UP and Northern Wisconsin. Have you ever written about your childhood experiences there from Liz? Oh, hi, Liz. Yes, Sorry. well, you know my, well, anybody who's worked with me knows that my literary hero, may he rest in peace, was Jim Harrison. And Jim Harrison um, wrote all about the UP. And where we used to go in Wisconsin was just a half an hour south of the UP. So, so I spent tons of time in the UP. And I fell in love with Jim Harrison's work when I, when I was 18. And when I read his book, Dalva. No, I actually read Sundog first and then Dalva. And I thought, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to write fiction. And by the end of his life, Jim and I were friends. And it was so ironic because he ended up living here in Montana, down in Livingston. Here's Montana again. Here's, wait, here's where I am down here near Bozeman, um, near the and Michigan, West. ironically, is this, right? Montana, only this way. The hand. Where do you live in Michigan? Montana? Yeah, Montana. Oh, yeah. We're kind of um, so Jim, um, Jim, by the end of his life, I mean, we were friends. He always said, I'll, you know, I'll blurb, I'll blurb your book. If you, I'll blurb a novel, if you can get it published. And it was ah, just like a year before he died. But, um, that's, if you're a, if you're a youper, you gotta read Jim Harrison, all of you. His poetry is my favorite. His book, The Theory and Practice of Rivers is just and actually, the beginning and end of this book um, is uh, has an excerpt of a, a Jim Harrison book. But yeah, I've got a deep, deep, deep connection with the, the northern Midwest. Really quickly before we go, do memoirs from Michelle McShane, do memoirs serve as a means of flushing issues out of one's life so that you're sort of making room for fiction? That's a great way to look at it. Hi, Michelle, by the way, Haven alum, not to expose you, I hope that's okay. You just um, exposed her, by the way. <laughs> just I am yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Michelle. Yes, of course, because writing, like I said before, it has to be for you first. I mean, unless, I mean, I don't know, I could argue this with any kind of genre, whether it's romance, mystery, sci-fi, you know, thriller. I, I do believe it's a way, like I said, it's a way for us it should be up there with diet and exercise in the realm of preventative wellness. And my friend, Jesse Cornbluth, the critic, and Lee, you know, Jesse, I've got a picture of the three of us together um, at, at something that we did in New York. Oh, at Mary, at, well, at a person who's actually, never mind, I won't expose, but um, he is an, if you don't know headbutler.com, check it out. He's it's like website, online yeah. Concierge. It makes me feel smart every time I, I read, you know, what he has to recommend. And he really says that writing is entertainment. It's writing. And my friend, David Baker, the poet, um, he taught at the university that I attended says that it's that writing is not therapeutic. So we get into these wonderful arg arguments. It's really what it means to you. And isn't that just it? Yeah. It's a personal and no one can actually tell you 
what it is to you, which I think is your relationship, your own, all, all of our own relationship. And right. nobody asks us to do it, right? Nobody asks us to do it unless we've got like a two book deal or a writing assignment. But if we just are, like I said, sitting on the edge of our bed thinking, how can I capture something? How can I write into a, a pressing question that I want to answer in whatever genre? It's really just about you. And not very many people say, I'll make you a cup of tea, sweetheart. And, you know, just clear the deck so that you can write all day. We have to claim that time we have to fight for it and there's no promise of getting published even best-selling authors have no promise so so that's why i think so getting back to community that's why we don't it is a solitary act but it's as terry tempest williams one of my literary heroes says it's born of community and that's what we're doing right now you know it's so important to share your truth share your stories so that you can return to your self-expression, whether whether you're a writer or not, and find the truth in it, not the acting, not the pretending, not the hiding. That is a beautiful place to end. But before we do, I just want to look at Andrew's comment because he enjoys your passion or adores your passion rather around writing and also grew up in the Palm of Michigan. My husband, in fact, is from Detroit and I know what a pasty is, by the way, if anyone <laughs> had one of those, look it up if you're not from the UP. And I love what you said, Andrew, that more men would benefit from what Laura has to share about how to clear the decks. And, and I believe that too. And I think, Laura, you ought to think about creating a men's only or somewhere in the non-binary spectrum with of the male genre. Um, and that would be wonderful and probably really have many different levels on something like that i you know i agree and yet i'm not doing it i i want to just keep everything i do open to anybody who's a good a good match um and Get it. you know i'm because it, it's not it's not my you asked me about teaching I, I know how to help people figure out what it is that they have to say and translate it into the written word and so people and it's never an issue um, on the on the retreats if um, they're different genders, age. People are concerned. I'm only 20, you know. I'm only well. You have to be 21 to come, or I'm 87, and it doesn't matter. We're all humans. This is human heart language we're tapping into. Okay, so at the beginning, Kathy from the amazing library talked about these bookmarks. I got all these done for my book tour, and then the book tour got canceled. So um, I have them. And they're beautiful and they've got a writing prompt that comes straight from willow's grove on them if you would like me to sign one then i'll send it to um the Pratt library and it, i know they work in conjunction with diane's um diane book the diane's bookstore yep right? it's a great one in greenwich it's a fabulous bookstore and thank you all for keeping it alive um as yes. well as your library because where would we be without our libraries and the women and men who support them so i just Absolutely. want to give a shout out to our libraries Absolutely. and i agree wholeheartedly thank you for all you've done um, with bookstores and libraries and the other thing is i wanted to offer something tonight um haven nest my online ongoing community um is really incredible it's everything's archived there's also live stuff i've got about six months of archived lessons writing exercises experts uh, live workshops that are archived you can uh you can come in uh and just kind of do like dive in it's not cumulative so you can dive in wherever you want with the lessons and enrollment is closed right now and won't be opened until 2022 but because i really care about of course my dear friend lee and so many of the people here who um, are already a part of nest and this wonderful library i thought it would be pretty cool to open up enrollment just for this group whoever's here tonight um so if you're interested in doing it i can open it up and give you the special rate which is the last rate um that i offered which is 97 dollars a month which is a steal for all the and, wait, and give us your website or maybe you can put it in the chat or whatever it's, is it's lauramunson.com lauramunson.com couldn't be easier than that how do we spell the last name just kidding m-u-n-s-o-n there was a character in one of your books named Munson. And that was because of you. Way. So there. <laughs> so <Yeah>. there. <laughs> you guys, you're amazing. This was so much fun. Laura is, now you can see why we all love Laura. And there's a love fest going on in the chat, just in case you're having <laughs> a bad day, in case you're never going to see your wine again. 
UPS <laughs> guy's got a couple bites out of his fanny and he's lying in the snow somewhere. So that's on you. Okay. Answer your doorbell next time. We'll all wait. Thank you, everyone. Kathy, anybody have some last words to close out? We so appreciate you hosting. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you so much, Laura. And we look forward to having you back in person someday at Pratt Library. Yeah, that's a deal. I would love to be there. I was hoping to be there in person. Um, and I know that we'll be back there again, maybe with my next book. I just have to. Yes. Be there you, you go. An, there you, you both go. have an open invitation anytime. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great Everybody night. Have a great weekend. Don't forget the time changes this weekend, I think. It does? I think it's fall back. Yeah. We get an extra hour. Look at it that way. And Stand Up for Heroes is November the what? Eighth? Monday. I but we're pretty sold out. We're in a small theater this year. But yeah, next year we'll blow that out big. We were concerned with COVID. I did it when I got for that. It's incredible. Just plug it for next year. It's amazing. I, 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 I will plug it next time. You can go to the bobwoodrefoundation.org and learn all about it. But thank you, Kathy, for talking about it. Um, I'm really, I, I, it's actually more than $80 million that we've raised for injured vets and their families. So we'll do it again Monday night. And they are, there's a lot of food insecurity going on with our veteran communities right now. So if any of you have a chance to give to food banks and all of that, it's really critical time for all of us. So thank you. Love you, Lee. Thank you so you much. Too. Kathy. Thanks, Kathy and Good the Pratt Library gang. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Good night. Good night.